Well, welcome everyone to the David Raven School of Architecture colloquium series in conjunction with the, in the last talk in the series in conjunction with our curated urbanisms in a drawdown uh, theme this year. Very pleased to welcome Dr. Mona Azerbaijani, who's an associate professor and graduate program director in the school, as I think all of you know. Uh, Mona obtained her PhD from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and joined our institution in 2010. Her research focuses on energy analytics, high performance and healthy buildings, and user-centered design with new technologies. She examines integrated systems between physical, computational, and human physiological parameters and quantifies human and environmental health through funded research. She has much of that. And uh, just a plug for her new book, High Performance Double Skin Facade Buildings, Climatic-Based Exploration, was recently published by Rutledge. So please join me in welcoming Mona. Thank you so much for the <laughs> nice introduction, Blaine. Just wanted to see, oh, they do not see that, they see my screen. That's not good. Sorry, folks online. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there we go. Now it's right. Hey, thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I know that uh, you know during the uh, lunch time or in the middle of your lunch. Um, I appreciate those who are also joining us online. I would like to talk about uh, some of the research we have been doing on the user-centered design and integration of AI to provide thermal comfort for the occupants and also the energy efficient um, buildings. And also the uh, second project that I would like to discuss is the uh, this simulator, integrated facade simulator that um, we have developed uh, in the lab and uh, with the help of uh, Greg, we also built it um, with the design and also the kind of the building of that uh, project. I would like to also share that with you. Uh, so let me start. You already know the concept of the user-centered design, but just for those who don't know, is the user-centered design is that basically putting the users in the center of the design. So thinking about the users as a, as the center of the how they experience. So this day you see that in the architecture firms, how they like they basically put the user-centered design as a one of the terminology they use. They have people sitting around the room and they ask the clients or the users, how would you like the building to be designed? And how would you like to have this? This is not quite uh, quite the user-centered design that we would like to see in the architecture uh, kind of realm. We want to have that to basically uh, show them what are the limitations of the uh, you know, the design and how they kind of like understand that that program side of it, not just that how would they like the what is their wish list. So just like a kind of quick example of like how on the products or the kind of the architecture it can, um, you know, uh, show is that the exit sign that you probably like this is what you have been seeing since you were like little and you don't think about that, you know, what's wrong with it. So the exit sign, this is the first thing that people who came to the US, maybe they, that's one of the things that they, like, why is it like, it says exit, it has a red color, which is red, you think that red means a stop, not go. <laughs> but it's also like, you know, it's, you know, that's where you need to go to. This is the exit sign for the Japan. So it has the Japanese exit, but also like you probably don't know Japanese, I don't know that the exit is underneath, it says exit, it's green. And also it says that this is the way you need to go. And it's kind of like have a direction and it's green because that's, you know, if a toddler see that, knows that, okay, green means go, red means stop. This is what we need to do in the architecture as well. So that, you know, the experience of the people, when you go to a building, not think about it as an architect. So since I, uh, hang out a lot with the computer science folks. So their experience of the building, their, their, their way finding and how they are experiencing it in terms of the, you know, where the elevators are, what are the, 
uh, you know, signs that show them how to explore the buildings. It's totally different than uh, an architect. You guys just, I mean, we all just design the building in terms of the, the programs or in the case that I would like to discuss is that the kind of the comfort and the energy performance. And we are not really thinking about those toddlers or, you know, regular people and how they are experiencing it. So just putting it out there as like the concept, but what I really want to discuss is that the user centered design in terms of the putting the users in that uh, loop of the um, comfort as well as the control of the building. So we are, the way that we are uh, designing and also uh, simulating the buildings, doing the energy simulation is that we have some data, external data, some interior data, and we do energy simulation. We really do not have, we do not take into account the physiological, psychological aspect of the human. That is not part of the loop. So the concept of putting that human back in the loop and getting those data from him in terms of the, how they feel in the space, their perception, and how they feel in terms of the, the comfort and uh, visual and then thermal comfort. So this is what I would like to do that I, I would like to discuss. We can do that intrusively with, uh, you know, there are lots of other ways to do it intrusively with the wristband to get their physiological data or not. What I would like to discuss is the non-intrusive way of how we can put the, put the human back in the loop of the, of the design in the design process. So the discrepancy between the energy consumption, there is a discrepancy between the actual energy consumption and that expected energy consumption that we see. So we are designing it, we do simulation. It tells us that, uh, uh, it tells us like this is how the, the consumption, what we do not really like take into account the human behavior. That's the uncertainty for the, for the designers that when they are doing the simulation at the design stage, and then it goes to the, the control loop of the, during the operation phase, we are not, we are not accepting the, uh, the uh, we are not accepting those feedback from the occupants. And we didn't even like take into account their, uh, you know, uh, in that kind of simulation. So, sorry, somebody's like, I think I get so many echoes. Let me put people on mute. <laughs> sorry, guys. If you're not muted, I appreciate you put yourself on mute. Okay, thank you so much. Then, um, so uh, talking about the kind of like that discrepancy, so why is that, why is that an issue or why is it happening is that, so think about that, how complicated it is from that regional scale, we go to that urban scale that we need to address all these external forces of the sky condition, site characteristics, and uh, that how that impact on the indoor condition, and then the user experience in the building, uh, those are all the factors that are need to be considered. And then, you know, then we get to that building scale, that all the information that at the building scale, the design decisions regarding to the materials, regarding to the selection of the, uh, you know, the windows, the use of the shading devices, that all impact also the interior uh, environment and that energy uh, kind of consumption. Then you, we, uh, this is the part that we are kind of ignoring that behavior response of the occupants and their perception of that visual and thermal comfort and their kind of that, that their response into all of these, that needs to also be taken into account. So we need to take into account their needs and preferences and putting it back into that feedback loop of the operation. So for the user domain. So all that kind of said, this is something that you have, you know, you have experience or your colleagues have experienced or you are like, you know, you just like heard of it probably. So 
what it is is that how many of us working in a uh, you know environment that we're not really comfortable with that thermal you know thermal aspect of it I'm not talking about visual just a thermal aspect the we are spending 90% of our time. And it, this is kind of like pre-COVID that people were in the office. So these days, like, you know, we can kind of make a better choices of where we want to spend time in. But it's still like, you know, doing the work in any environment, you are not comfortable in that environment. And the concept of the sick building syndrome of not just indoor air quality, but that impact of the comfort on the productivity and the uh, and the kind of like basically the health of the occupants is quite becoming more, uh, you know, these days very popular in terms of that we need to take that into account. There are several studies, so this is you already know the energy consumption, the 40% of the energy total global produced energy goes into the buildings and this, it, occupants are still not comfortable in that environment. But there are several studies that shows that uh, in regards to the uncomfortable, unhealthy thermal conditions. And I just want to reference three of them. This is the tweets from 2010 to 2019 uh, that, uh, that they have looked at. This is a UC Berkeley looked at the, the tweets, the collected from 16,000 to its common expressions of a cold discomfort in the office buildings that how tweets is different between men and women and also looking at the trend of that where the men started tweeting about a, a condition of the, the comfort and where women started. So you see that women started to like more, I mean, they are like not comfortable in the, in the uh, winter time there, but as they go to the, um, Summertime, men stop like basically tweeting, complaining about the environment, and women start to kind of come. So we see some inequity in terms of the the comfort also uh, in the offices that is kind of like designed and operate for the uh, clothing of men versus women. The second study on the left side is that at another kind of larger scale surveys, looking at the how satisfied and insatisfied people are with their environment. And you see that the second complaint was it after noise was temperature. So that, uh, you know, the, this is basically a 20 year study, again, um, UC Berkeley, that looked at the indoor thermal conditions of indoor environment. And the study shows this kind of global survey results of 20 year study that focus mostly on the office building. Um, the third study, which is this one is, uh, this is very interesting. Again, by UC Berkeley, looking at that, we are, we are teaching the students about thermal comfort that 80% of the people might, I mean, should feel comfortable in the space. And that is the you know, kind of definition of the comfort that this space is comfortable. But after looking at um, 52,980, uh, 80 occupants in 351 office buildings located mostly in North America, they realize that only 2% of the people are satisfied. Only 2%, not 80% of the occupants. So we see that this is like these many unsatisfied people with a thermal condition and the numbers are quite kind of surprising. It, uh, I don't want to get to that kind of the cost issues, but that is also how that, uh, you know, not being comfortable impact on the productivity and the health of the people that result into the 50 to uh, kind of 75 billions annually in terms of the cost for the health and missing the days that the uh, occupants are working. This is also like pre-COVID. So we do not have much of the data on the after, after COVID that people didn't go to the office as often. So why is that? Why like, you know, all these studies like kind of suggesting that the issue of the uncomfort and we are still looking at the predictive mean vote for, um, you know, teaching the thermal comfort and also calculating the comfort. We are still using this uh, basically predicted mean vote, which is from 1960. And 
that is, and I teach that too, I think Liz probably teach that too, that we are teaching the students that this is how we are calculating the thermal comfort, looking at these environmental factors, the four environmental factors, and only clothing and also the activity as part of that formula. Then, uh, so to predict the average comfort of a large population, again, not taking into account that individual and the user kind of uh, feedback that fits into the loop. So that is that kind of like looking at the, you know, all these factors, several factors, we see that we are generalizing that comfort. We are not looking into the gender, that physiological aspect, the ethnicity, psychological factors of each individual. But the, what model is needed is that to get all that data and we are like, you're good in getting all this data and how we can create a better model that can predict that comfort for the majority of the people. The other solution is that we are creating a personalized comfort for the occupants so that based on that, you know, their needs, they can, you know, not all the HVAC systems can uh, provide a personalized comfort, but by, uh, by putting them, systems that can to some degree address those needs of the occupants in regards to the uh, heating cooling we can bring it down to the more kind of comfortable way so to, to more um you know kind of the uh, comfort of that occupant but uh, one thing is that for the model we can based on those uh, the data that if the occupants are setting the you know sending those um feedback back to the system, we can take that data and with our AI, we can predict the, what would be that personalized comfort model look like. And with getting enough data, we can just make a better model than what we had in that uh, predicted mean votes that is just uh, looking at those four environmental factors and the two kind of like uh, constants that we are putting. So how can we do that? The selection of the feedback, we can do that by voting. We can have the, you know, the uh, occupants fill out the some type of a survey and we give that feedback loop back to the system. Um, and then also that there are some kind of uh, variables like that can get that uh, physiological kind of, uh, data and that can be giving back that to the to the system this is what we are focusing on um the, giving those physiological data but non-intrusively so you're not using any variables we are we are using the camera thermal camera to get that to get that data and that can feed into the uh, feedback loop so this, we got uh, some funding uh, thanks to the, um, the School of Architecture and the School of Data Science. We received fu some funding and one of our PhD students uh, focused uh, later, kind of take this research and uh, focus, Roshan and focus on this, on this project. Our uh, goal was, how can we use the thermal camera? So we uh, use the thermal camera to uh, get those, um, basically uh, predict that what is the needs and feed that to that. Uh, the train, first, we train the data in the AI and then how that can uh, give that back to the system and uh, make that space more comfortable. So this was not the first research that attempts to kind of integrate that thermal and visual. So we, we combine thermal camera and visual camera together, but there were some studies that, you know, very early stage that are trying to do that. So there is a still like a, uh, you know, long way to go to improve the, uh, our goal and the, the kind of the fill the gap. Um, so <clears throat> this is what we did there. This is one of the offices that we uh, create this as a set, test bed. And that's uh, one of our PhD students who graduated, uh, Amir. Uh, he, he was the subject in this <laughs> project. So <clears throat> what we did is that first uh, we have in this control setting, looked at the, uh, we, uh, we changed the thermo uh, thermostat from 21 degrees to 27 degrees in intervals, and then mm -hmm. uh, look at that 
basically that if we can predict based on the thermal camera can read correctly based on the temperature of the of the cheeks and the kind of the face first detecting that and because the thermal camera is not a, as accurate so we have another camera so two cameras that uh, RGB camera and the uh, uh, thermal camera and Roshan work hard to kind of like uh, try to kind of map these two together and mask those areas that we wanted to read those um, numbers from. So we get the, like the forehead. And then we also, in order to verify that data is correct, we put these uh, temperature sensor eye buttons on the people's face and to see like if we are reading the correct number and comparing it. So this was our early kind of a stage. The second stage was that because uh, those who are kind of familiar with the thermal camera and the uh, RGB camera is that, so the person you go like in the past, they were using it for the COVID too, you go to these thermal cameras and you're so close and you're just looking, your face is next to it and you can kind of read, right? Or with the, you know, those kind of handgun thing. But we are talking about the distance and having non-intrusively, so it's in a space and reading the temperature of the people and trying to modify, get that as a, like a, in that feedback loop. So we needed to look at the different distance and also the person is not, uh, you know, basically is not aware of that, the camera and is not perfectly located. So it's different angles. So we wanted to make sure that our data is correct if the person is wearing glasses or, uh, you know, different kind of uh, directions looking and our data is uh, detecting the correct number. So that was as part of the kind of training the data and seeing that if it's doing the correct, uh, uh, we're gathering the correct data and training it correctly, the AI. Then, um, at the same time, so then we go to that, uh, you know, uh, we, we train the data. We wanted to see that how people are getting that, that uh, sensation and their thermal preference of the people as part of that control loop. So bringing that into that, into that equation and seeing that how we can get their feedback by asking these questions, sets of the questions and how they are feeling. But again, the same kind of a scale of, a slightly cool, cool, cold, or warm and slightly warm and warm. How approximately we looked at a thousand frames capture for each subjects, and then uh, seeing that how people are sensing that what we are thinking that they they based on that uh, the temperature of their face how they are sensing. So this is like a, this is Roshana, and she did the she did the study of basically capturing the image, cropping the face, masking it, and making sure that it's that the thermal camera and that uh, RGB camera works together, and then landmark detection and uh, the landmark transformation. So this was a huge kind of like portion of that study that she did for the, um, for her PhD. And looking at, then we looked at the, the errors of based on that eye button and the, you know, the numbers that we were reading for different kind of directions and different, uh, basically distance, how much was the error and try to minimize that too. It, it was actually, you know, one area, most of the uh, errors were uh, small, but one area was like 4%, but I think it was, that was pretty also good. Mm -hmm. So, the, the kind of skipping that forehead and just focusing on those cheeks. Um, influence, as I said, the influencing of that, that distance, the position, and uh, getting that how much of that that is going to impact on the on the reading. So to have a better understanding of the influence of that distance on the thermal infrared readings, and also that kind of maximum recorded values for the forehead and uh, you know other kind of data set that that she did. Um, this was um, so kind of like to uh, to put that into the context. Getting all those data and, uh, you know, with that thermal camera, that can feed into the loop. And by 
by doing this in a you know long time, you can predict that each of these person is at what temperature they feel comfortable and at what is their kind of comfort level. And that can, if the, you know, if the building is a, uh, you know, we cannot change the mechanical system, that personalized comfort, they can be automatically, so the person doesn't need to do anything, that we can control that for them. Or if it's a new building and the HVAC can be a personalized um, HVAC system based on the people and getting the enough data from those occupants who are in, uh, you know, kind of like based on the, uh, you know, old data, we can we can kind of see that what is a better providing comfort for those occupants. So this is also, we created this video to give you a visualization of like, so each person who is walking in the room and it's everything is also privacy preservative. So we are not recognizing the face. What we are doing is that we are just giving them a number that this person here is like, you know, uh, his or her, no, basically comfort data and that is kind of like a you know in a smart way we can create a better uh, environment for those like you know number of people so that I'm going to uh, you know kind of switch to this this it, this is also I, I really like this this project and my goal is to kind of integrate the two so this is the well, um, Greg has been involved um, a lot with the kind of the design and also the um, building a construction of this uh, solar simulator. The, giving you a little bit of the background. Um, so building a performance simulation, you are familiar with the um, BPS that the drawbacks on it, that it's really like we are, the models that we are doing is really looking at these physical factors, the building attribution and the kind of interior design. We are not like taking into account any of those, uh, you know, occupants. The new way of doing that, they are including the human behavior in kind of the design stage. Architects are using this immersive virtual reality for the, uh, basically that can create that space virtually for the occupants. But what is like they have been looking at, mostly they're looking at a single sensory that is like, you know, for instance, they're looking at the daylight, the discomfort related to those visual, uh, you know, uh, aspects such as the daylight model, or they're looking at the, the effect of that thermal condition, but just Nobody has been looking at this as a holistically, or they have been looking at a multi-sensory, but for the multi-sensory, they, uh, they are changing the temperature to uh, account for solar heat gain. So they are really, nobody's looking at this as a holistic, the thermal and also the visual perception as a whole together. So this is a, what is important is that the solar radiation sitting next to a window is that it's not just that heating aspect of it, but also that feeling and the perception of the occupants. So if we can create that, you cannot create that with the uh, with the VR. But what what uh, um, kind of like it uh, we have been uh, doing is that if we can create it that thermal sensation of the sun with that VR combination. So the physical, so you can do that physical prototyping. And building energy simulation that fits into the building energy simulation. So iteratively, you can change that facade system and looking at how people perceiving it with that immersive virtual reality. That is what we came up with that, the hybrid solar uh, simulator. So that is the, that um, leads into Amir's uh, PhD um, project, which is, uh, he looks at the, uh, kind of the human behavior and how they are responding to the facade and also giving that they look at, uh, uh, he uh, studied the perception and also that uh, feedback of that, how they're feeling in regards to that facade. So what is, what exactly it does is that, uh, you know, the, in a test bed, he created that, uh, you know, the HVAC that provides that kind of like mimicking what is happening in that HVAC system. With that VR, he can see and uh, see how the person is in that space. And having this solar uh, simulator 
is that it's mimicking the sun so that if there is if a new design, the person can build a very simple prototype of that shading device or the facade and putting in front of that solar simulator, which mimics the sun and uh, putting that person in that space can see how they feel and also uh, the visual perception as well as their comfort of um, you know the person within it. So this is the uh, study that um, actually Roshanek was involved to say that uh, they went through in regards to the um, basically the uh, choosing the lamps and um, at the end with the you know wisdom of uh, uh, Greg that building that solar simulator and then also being a movable that uh, that is also can change its direction and the angle of that can mimic any location on basically on earth and then they did the validation of course so this the whole um uh you know kind of idea is that that is the the sun and you can change the direction of it based on the location and then you put your a shading device or that kind of that facade assembly very simply in front of it and with that immersive virtual reality and the solar simulator you're creating that experience similar experience without spending much to to kind of see that how people are uh, reacting what is their perception and then you can kind of feed that with, uh, just going back to my previous um, point of feed that into that loop for that, considering it inside of that uh, uh, energy consumption. So this is the, this is you, uh, you already been to the IDRL lab. And uh, the, the, so he went to uh, Greg's place and he built it at his house most of it. So it was, it was quite a, a project. And the, uh, this is that that sun basically. So the person going into the office, and we have um, different kind of like basically shading devices that you can you want to explore as a designer. You put it at the in in that um, door area, and with that um, solar simulator that creates that uh, mimicking the sun. The person who is inside is just similar that sensation wise is similar that he's sitting in front of the window with this type of shading device or a, you know a different uh, facade strategy and with that VR he can kind of like have that visual perception of that that space as well. So what we did this was like uh, I I taught this seminar a couple of years ago. These are the uh, prior to kind of like building that solar simulator. So we did, we had the student, they designed, uh, or not they designed, they kind of like choose a case study and they put that case study, this was like a non-movable, it was just like the lamps, and then uh, put the shading devices in front of that uh, solar simulator. And then with that VR, they were experiencing and giving us feedback in terms of their perception and their comfort. Um, so that was like a, a prior to building this. This is the after it's built and the you know that kind of like using it in that test bed area, which is one of the offices in there. So the, we had the control of the HVAC and then also looking at this uh, person. So what it is is that basically we can with this technology, we can predict the perception and the visualization component of that design. So the architects can better understand. So usually they do a prototype. They can better understand of that, how people in regards to their health and in regards to that comfort. And then that, that uh, model, he feeds in into the energy consumption that can compare with that selection of that, you know, different design strategies. And based on that can look at the environmental comfort and also the energy saving. So this is kind of like showing that flow of that, you know, to doing it for the energy consumption. And that was my last slide. Thank you so much. And please let me know if you have any questions. I also want to thank the 
uh, you know, I already mentioned the, um, the SOA and also the School of Data Science. And then my colleague also at the Tescar Lab, who, is, uh, who was my collaborator, uh, Dr. Chafi, and the students uh, who are graduated now, they're doctors. So Dr. Roshanak Ashrafi and uh, Dr. Amir Zarabi. And thanks uh, also, Greg, for his help with, with uh, Amir's kind of project a lot. Um, I take questions now. Thank you. Yes. In the first study, the study, actually, I have three questions. Sure. <laughs> Did you find there was a predictable level of correlation between face temperature and the comfort condition? Very good. So yeah, this the study that they have had on the physiological the variables. So the, the those are the intrusive. So they put it, but it's like there are some discrepancy, and this the occupant needed to go back and kind of like basically give their feedback. But with the thermal camera, without uh, you know, kind of like basically we can see that if the person is in a comfort based on the the temperature of your your face, so that and the activity that you're doing, we can predict that if you're in a comfort or not. Mm -hmm. And that is why the, you know, her kind of research is, um, what is she's kind of like adding to the knowledge is that using that this, uh, RGB camera, thermal camera to, uh, to uh, uh, what consider that the areas that can basically uh, read as far as the temperature and that can uh, correlate that to your comfort. Okay, that's interesting. So, did you, you mention glasses? Yes. Did glasses and beards and like things on the face have you guys? No. The, so, the one thing you said that at the beginning, uh, the the kind of hypothesis was that the research that she has done that these two points is the closest to temperature mm -hmm. of that. So, if you are wearing glasses, we cannot really like find those. So, what she did was that she looked at the cheeks and the forehead. And if you're not wearing the glasses, those points can also be be used. But if you are wearing glasses, we don't have that. So the the che the cheeks and the forehead, and that um, you know, kind of like that. These three areas that she used. The beards were, I, I, in the slide you had mirroring a beard. Sorry, yeah. That. So she she looked at actually a lot makeup, like. You know, if you have too much makeup, <laughs> you have less makeup. So all of that to see, like, how is that impact of the, so the beer, I think, yeah. So that's the, the thermal camera. It can um, do that based on the cheeks. It's very, uh, you know, you can see the errors. It's very minimal. And also she released the, you know, for, for those who are like, into the AI, she also released that uh, training data. So for the other researcher to be able to use that. And uh, yeah, so we have like two journal papers and one of them we published the, the uh, trained data. I don't know what that means, but I... I, I <laughs> it is, yeah. Oh, okay, my last question. When you were doing thermal comfort, was it... Was it only about temperature, or did you? I know one of them has like a fan in there. Did you get the right. velocity? Great, great question. So they, they, as far as the, like, basically they have influence, of course, but for the hair PhD study, those, the, she didn't play with the, you know, different uh, ventilation rate. She didn't play with the kind of the humidity level. So she just basically look at that reading of that thermal um, cameras and how that can predict their you know, comfort model. But of course, that is like, a, you know, that's another two other PhDs to so have like, look at the you know, change of that and see how is that it can be like, is it going to be adverse impact in regards to our trained model or not? Great question. Thank you. Using the thermal camera to predict comfort, is that, is that sort of based around the assumption that everyone's going to have the same internal body temperature of what, like 98.6 degrees? Or where's where, where that able to make, um, you know, compensate for uh, like different? Different yeah, so the, the physiological kind of, so we are really not, so there are two things. One is that 
you are giving feedback. So one part of the study is that we are getting your feedback. So one part of the study is that we are reading that temperature. So we wanted to see that based on that, our predictive model is that the person also reporting that he's comfortable so that you are the same person, but if you're comfortable and our predictive model is also saying that you're comfortable. So that was part of that kind of train. But yeah, the person's kind of physiological would change, but that also impacts your, uh, this is that the temperature that's also changing based on that. Great question. And, you know, I think the, the predictive system, you know, works really well when, or it could work really well when you're, um, like in your test simulation where you have one person in a small room, but what if you have a, a larger space that has 20 or 50 or 100 people in it? You know, what, <laughs> how do you decide, you know, um, whose comfort you prioritize? Great question. So that is why the, we are doing that. We are basically getting each individual and then we are trying to get that into an average for all of those people all of those people who are going to that space so that you know that if it's a, a individual office you can just basically get that into your personalized but if it's a you know a space that is for so many people then it's kind of like an average of all those folks i think it's you know super interesting research moment with uh, tremendous potential and I'm wondering how you thus far have navigated or might navigate the inevitable questions about privacy and data right access and confidentiality. I mean, you mentioned before, and I we've we've talked about this before yeah. with your research that you know it's just anonymized or but uh, there's such potential for occupant health, building energy use, everything as you know well. For this research and especially the non-invasive aspect of it but combined with or or in in light of those possible concerns right about, you know and, and now companies are kind of monitoring employees more than ever before right and, and they're concerned there's backlash to that so how i'm just curious how you that that's a very good question so the you know the uh, the ai part or also like the, the thermal comfort we are not uh, we are not recording any of those so that as you see you couldn't really like recognize that was I mean I told you that was Roshan so that you like yeah. you know we know that was her but there is like no way that of the recognition so what uh, we have another student that was also helping was that there is a, like a number associated with each individual so that on the top of their head basically would be that it's a number so we don't know that this person is this that has like this much of you know this is what their comfort level is but that that number associated with that with that person so you know the the AI part I just uh, that's on my kind of like my forte but uh, they are saying that the most privacy preservative is that we are not um, recognizing any face and we are not recording any data other than that number that is associated with that um, individual. Great question. Yes, yes, we went through the IRB. Thanks, Kat, also, if you have been working with her, she's very helpful. <laughs> Anna. I don't know, but actually, two more questions that maybe not questions, but right? Yeah, probably for temperature change, but it will decrease to decrease, but there are regulations that decrease to decrease. And it means that CO2 concentration will be higher or lower, but the CO2 concentration is made higher than the mean mm -hmm. uh, thing which is the increase. The health. Right. Yeah, the, a great a question. So <laughs> as I was telling Liz, so this was the, uh, you know, there are lots of factors so that the humidity level, the ventilation rate, that velocity is that we are, we 
you know, that's also like, you know, it's a continuum. So I don't want to say that we, we haven't stopped yet <laughs> the, uh, the project. This is what we have come so far. It's like, it's been like two years, I think that we have done this project. Uh, but now we're kind of like focusing more on the health aspect of it. But, uh, you know, if I get uh, applied for some fundings, but if we get some funding, we I would love to have like students who work on that similar to what you are doing as part of your master's thesis, um, that students who are like focusing on all these different variables and looking at the ventilation rate, the humidity, and kind of like, then feeding that back to the loop and see how that impacts. Yeah. Right. Sound. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just when you start talking about comfort, my comfort center range in the sense of the day is like not if I walk to the bathroom, if I at lunch or, you know, like, exactly. It's so complex. And I think the machine learning component has a, a powerful, it, it, that aspect of it is going to help us get out of the CMD area that, you know, we went in in the 60s and that was just right. Exactly, exactly. That you know, things that we cannot really like do with these uh, these factors. But as we get more data and we train the AI, it can have a much better model of what we had in 1960. And just taking into account, yes, Elena. Great work. Uh, I'm curious Thank how you. how accurate this solar simulator. That was so interesting. Like. Can you talk more about it? Sure. But you said for like how accurate are we on it in terms of like the data? Sure. So uh, you know the um uh, AMI kind of like project, that is also like I need to, I need two more fish this one. <laughs> one focus on it. One focus on it. <laughs> Anna. Yeah, anybody with like Siri Um Amy, you too. So that, um, you know, the solar simulator, interesting. So Amir got, uh, you know, had some health issues, but the idea was that, it, so he built the thing, that was a that was a whole PhD and, you know, Greg helped a lot with the, with the building, but that, like just that is study of like the, uh, you know, prior studies, then get to this, okay, here's like how they can model it and then verify that, that's a, like one PhD, but then, you know, our goal at the beginning was that we uh, we get enough data from the solar simulator and different facade, and that can lead in, uh, that can feed into the AI, uh, and we train our AI that can predict so that you know the designer doesn't need to actually like you know do the test for for that uh, facade system. It can uh, feed into the model, and it can tell that how people, you know, the perception of the people is and how it can impact the energy consumption by considering the human in the loop. But that that part didn't happen. So we, we uh, you know, finished the building and I, I then he kind of like validated that it was, it is working in terms of the, uh, you know, basically mimicking what it, uh, the sun is at that angle, the efficacy of the uh, of the model and that solar heat gain. But we really didn't get to that portion of uh, testing it with so many different fossils. So he just did like probably four or five different case studies and looking at that uh, energy predictive versus that what the model was kind of like showing. So that, that would be our next kind of a uh, step so these two studies yeah we, uh, these two studies are like you know conti yeah. continue continue <laughs> where is that device it now? is in the lab, it's still in the lab. Okay. yeah so the, the, you know todd was giving me uh todd you're not on the call <laughs> <laughs> but he was giving me a hard time with the uh fire aspect which he was right uh in terms of the the fire aspect of it that if the person is in the room and you are testing it and there's a fire, so how the person is getting out and like, you know, it's because we're blocking it, but this. Like the fire will come from the human. Yeah. Um, and then the, the fire would, you know, exactly. Fire, fire on me. <laughs> yeah. So that's why we, like, he was like, we haven't really like done much uh, studies. Uh, 
recently, but uh, hopefully we can get a student <laughs> and we can get that. Uh, and I need a mini house. We do, the yeah. one that, that's yeah. outside. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mark. We need marks, yeah. I was like, when I saw <laughs> marks, uh, it's like perfect size and it's looking for a location. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, we need to talk to him <laughs> if we can use that for the solar simulator. And I think that our student would benefit a lot from that solar simulator that they, yeah. they can kind of like build their model and then kind of test it and see how the perception is, what is the comfort in full scale, scale for some yeah. model. You can always sell it to the talent that they can use. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's another. <laughs> that's another. The volume is like that. Yeah. It is the sun. Yeah. Have you tried to do this? Speak to you about. Uh, Liz's point about different variables. I mean, view is obviously such a variable, and what we're seeing and apertures and interest of what we're right. I mean, it's I think it's part of why people have become more and more interested in travel and Airbnbs, both trying on at home, home opportunity or experience. And I'm I'm thinking maybe there's a way to incorporate Peter's research eye tracking, you know, could possibly also or or looking at ways that we can think about the qualitative aspects of an environment. In exactly, exactly. Yeah, that visual perception, that's a whole, you know, that with the VR, we can, that was it, you know, that was the goal to do that, that VR for the visual perception, yeah. uh, while it also that the thermal perception, you're really like, feeling whatever you were feeling if the building was built and yeah. you are in that space. The same thing, so there's a, there's a well building lab at Rochester at the Mayo Clinic. And they have, and they use intrusive sensors uh, and they collect tons of data constantly. They've got the whole sort of room full of computers to collect data on people and environmental things. But the design of that space is very you know, sterile. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It kind of makes sense. I mean, it, well, yeah, not literally sterile, but I mean, just the sort of aesthetics of the space is very sort of clinical. It's like, you know, base gray carpet. It's what you would expect, right? In terms of like kind of the most common office finishings one can imagine. Uh, so I'm just, I'm thinking that qualitative side for your VR side, it'd be interesting to, to change out different different environments with design, right? Exactly. And see what the physiological effects would be. Exactly. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the, uh, thank you for all these <laughs> great ideas. <laughs> it's, it is, we need, um, we do need like a, a Mark's kind of like house. Yeah. yeah, and then we can like set this off. But the issue would be that you cannot see the outside. So we have to build it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll build a house. house for this. And then, yeah, they, like, you know, the, there is no limitation. There were so many yeah. different things. Elena's, uh, adaptive kinetic design. Yeah, and that can be tested. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that works too. Yes. I want to pick on the spot a little bit. Sure. Like I've never seen your work in this conference twice. It's really awesome to see. Yeah. Um, and especially awesome because you're also the graduate student, graduate program director. So when you teach that graduate level, but also you go through the undergrad, you know, teach level research, which is really inspiring. So that being said, you know, you're the graduate program director. You know, how do you see this type of work factoring into graduate master's level and so like master of architecture of education? Great question, Liz. I've been I've been thinking about like a couple of ways. So I was like, I haven't like brought it up into the curriculum committee or blame yet, but 
I think, you know, I haven't, and I haven't been uh, teaching electives. So I was thinking, you know, two things that we need to basically train our future kind of generation is that one is the AI, AI in architecture. That's the area that we need to like equip our students to, uh, to learn. And then the other part is that, you know, kind of like that, that usages of all these tools. So there are two kind of aspects. So I was thinking to offer a course with the computer science folks on the AI. So he, uh, my colleague, he's already teaching to undergrads in the uh, engineering basic AI, and they can do, they can do chat GPT after the, you know, take that course basically. But the, uh, the taking the, uh, like co-teaching a course for the architecture students. I have, uh, actually, I at one time I uh, applied for one of the college uh, fund for this, but um, unsuccessfully. The, I would like to uh, you know, offer something that is the integration of the AI for architecture and um, you know, at first that uh, kind of basic AI and then getting into the, the higher level of that, how it can be integrated. So that kind of equip our students for the future, the future generation. So thank you, great question. Mm -hmm. More <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm so interested in data and machines and all of that, but it's like, well, we're teaching something from six to yeah. yeah. We do. And I do that too. I tell them that this is, this is my research, but I teach you to do the 1960. However, uh, you know, but we also like, you know, we do not have, hopefully with the, the Bearson building that's renovation, we get a lab that we can also use some of this research in a more kind of interdisciplinary that the students can take, not just like an elective, but also take an, a lab in that building to be able to play with that solar simulator, or I don't know if as part of the studio. But the, the issue is that we really, it's not safe you know, to Todd's point, to have a students who like go play with it, but we need, hopefully we can take it to that. I'm thinking the other venue would be that person building that, um, that we can take this to that, into that lab and like set it up properly so that we can have a students go play and you know, test their ideas. Thank you all so much. I didn't check if anybody had a question on this. But thank you all so much. Great questions.